Hello, welcome to Security Weekly News. Uh, we're doing a little special format today because we have a guest, uh, so we're just doing the news and uh, guest commentary today like we do on Tuesday. So we do, won't do any wrap-ups today, but you can go look that up if you want to. Uh, it's for the week of 12 September. We got Azure Linux, forced entry, ring zero threats, the DOT, Zoho, and special guest Jeremy Miller from Offensive Security, along with the news. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. It's the show that keeps you up to date on the latest security news twice a week. Your trusted source for accurate security information and expert analysis. It's time for Security Weekly News. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash barracuda. All right. You know, I, if you if you miss a live show yesterday where Paul and I built that... Uh, we built a computer live on the air, and they, they did capture it, of course, to show so you can watch it later. If you didn't get to see it, it's pretty fun. Uh, there were hammers involved uh, because the case was all bent. And it was, it was quite an interesting uh, event for me. I don't think I'd ever done that where I actually did that live on the air. So that was a little bit, you know, like intense. Uh, today we have uh, Jeremy Miller is going to join us in a little bit uh, to talk about... Uh, uh, we're going to talk about soft skills, which is quite, uh, to me, an interesting thing. Uh, but I'm going to do the top news stories first that we have coming up as soon as my prompter catches up because I forgot to delete some stuff that was on there from last week. Um, <laughs> so I'm kind of waiting on that to, 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 to flow through so I can get to my news stories. Uh, I'm just sort of going past all the wrap-up show stuff at that point. But the, the computer build was actually quite interesting. Paul bought all the parts. He put the parts picker list up on the site. And then we sat down and basically unboxed it and found the damage to the case and started banging on it with some hammers and got that straightened out. And then, um, you know, it was it was quite fun. All right. Uh, a series of vulnerabilities were found to exist in open management infrastructure software, which if you're unfamiliar with that, it's the Azure Linux cloud platform. So OMI is, is in Linux and it's embedded in a lot of other things. And so, you know, supply chain attacks. So that, I mean, that's how you get supply chain attacks in and of itself. Microsoft did issue a patch for these uh, in this patch Tuesday, which just happened this week. And the collection of vulnerabilities is being called Oh My God, I guess for the acronym, uh, and that represents a collection of zero-day vulnerabilities that were found by cloud infrastructure security company Wiz. Thousands of customers and millions of endpoints are vulnerable to this problem. So uh, basically, OMI is something that gets deployed automatically, and whenever you whenever you set up a virtual Linux machine, it's something that gets deployed alongside in Azure, and so it. And, and other Azure services use this as well. The OMI agent is running as root, uh, which you know is something that we all know is probably dangerous. And if you can access the socket for it, uh, you can actually execute remote code because it's running as root. So if you, if you can hit that socket. The article does state that most of the services using OMI don't open a socket on the network. But if they do, well, then, you know, it can be accessed and you have a major issue. But, uh, but so you may want to check if you're using that, if you're using Azure Linux uh, or other services that may use OMI. Uh, anyway, it's been patched, but definitely check the article out if you use any of those kind of services. The U.S. Department of Transportation was used as bait in a phishing scam, Inky, uh, which is a company that sells email filtering. But uh, so the article is a little bit, you know, ad, ad where kind of thing. But uh, Inky basically said they saw 41 phishing emails, which were pretending to be the U.S. DOT, talking about the trillions of dollars, which will theoretically flow out of the infrastructure bill, which is going through the U.S. Congress. 
Uh, basically, a domain was created, and this is why I actually reference this story. A domain was created called transportationgov.us, and it was registered and used as a basis for the scam emails. So if you don't, you know, as ever, if you don't pay a lot of attention to these phishing scams, uh, the linked site was a copy of the DOT site uh, to some extent, and it, it actually extolled the victims to click uh, on a link to bid on these government contracts. And basically, they copied the original site so thoroughly that they even included all the site's instructions on how to spot fake government sites. So, I mean, you know, but basically, I wanted to iterate the problem about how uh, domain registration can be such an issue and how domain filtering can be such a problem with email. So you, you definitely want to, you know, try to put filtering in place to manage that kind of stuff. And you want to manage your domain. So this one in particular was not a domain that everybody's going to be managing. But, you know, I've seen a lot of cities and towns that don't own their .gov sites and things like that. So, you know, whenever I see that, I usually point it out and they get upset. But it's just like, you know, your, your, your listing of, you know, dougville.com is not you know not going to be a good idea because people are going to either think it's a fake site or whatever so get your domains and register them up um whenever you hear ring zero you probably cringe uh, i mean i you know most of us do well an open source driver that's called winring zero.sys was to blame for a vulnerability that was found in the hp omen gaming hub uh the vulnerability was found by sentinel labs and showed that code was copied from the winring zero.sys driver uh, to be used in the HP Open Gaming Hub. And as such, you know, that, that particular driver is well known to be problematic. And so they just copied some code out of it. Uh, an attacker can use the CVE vulnerability to access the kernel mode of ring zero without having admin privileges. And, you know, that's always a bad thing. HP Omen versions prior to 11.6.3.0 and Gaming Hub SDK prior to version 1.0.44 are vulnerable to this attack. HP did release patches on the 14th of September. Uh, it's an interesting issue, though, to me. Of, of it's an it's another S bomb issue, uh, which the software bill of materials. Uh, but it's really more about reusable code rather than API, which was the S bomb was targeted at. I mean, I don't know if it, I mean a, anybody I know that's an application developer or programmer, including myself. Everybody's used code that they borrowed from some other code that maybe we wrote, maybe somebody else wrote, or in modern context, you just download it from GitHub. And in this case, they borrowed the code from a driver that's had problems in the past, and well, they just embedded the same problem into the code. I mean, you know, a signed API li library isn't going to help here because they just copied some code out of something else. So I guess my point would be that it would be it should be part of a dev process to evaluate code like this, but it's really difficult because, you know, there's all this code and you don't know which parts were borrowed and which parts were written and so forth. Uh, so I don't know how we flag this, but it's definitely a problem. I don't think this would qualify for the S bomb since they didn't actually use a library. They didn't use API. They just copied the code from some driver file. And I mean, I used to copy stack code all the time from an app, you know, from one app to another app. So I didn't have to rewrite it every time. And so if it had had problems in it, you know, it's just a header file that I add to my C program so I could use the network. I mean, that's an old problem, but it's going to continue to escalate. I did want to reiterate about forced entry. We talked about that on Tuesday, but this is an Apple Zero Day that was patched this week in iOS system. Citizen Lab reported on the vulnerability, which is apparently being used for renewed attacks by NSO Group's Pegasus product, which I guess is not officially an attack. It depends on how you define an attack. But basically, this bug is a new bug that allows Pegasus to get going again, and it can allow a PDF, which will execute arbitrary code on the Apple uh, devices due to a flaw in the core graphics systems component. Uh, in this case, the report from Citizen Lab that the attack was done using iMessage, but this component means other vectors could be used as well. If you don't recall, Pegasus is a product that was sold to government, military, and police, according to NSO. Uh, it's then uh, those entities have this placed on targeted devices. Uh, they're usually, it's very expensive, so they're usually using this for big shots or activists or p other people, journalists that you don't like. And then the software can basically provide all sorts of data off that device back to the secret police. I mean, sorry, not, not secret police, the Committee for Public Safety, you know, for the children. So Pegasus is very controversial and continues to be a threat. So patch up your eye device with the, this new eye patch. Oh, eye patch. Arr, mateys. We're sailing on the sea of cheese bound for ring zero. Arr.
Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking when I wrote that. Um, Wednesday, Microsoft announced that they are retiring written passwords. Not really, but that's what the article said. Uh, they're retiring written passwords for personal accounts, which would include Outlook, OneDrive, and Family Safety. I don't even know what Family Safety is. I, I, I never think about that stuff. My daughter was just like, yeah, honey, play, have fun playing with those box cutters. It'll be, a, it, it'll be a learning exercise. But, I mean, we've all been thinking for a long time that passwords need to get a trip to the Pine Barrens for that long sleep but uh, for me, about since about 1985, but my plan to force everyone to have to spit in an attached cup in order to log your DNA wasn't really that popular, and it was kind of messy and gross. Um, I mean, we all know the common initial access vectors right now are brute forcing and credential stuffing. I mean, that really is the two biggies at the moment. And, you know, people are people, and they're, they're going to keep using Big Daddy as their username, and Daenerys is hot as their password over and over again. And well, you know, we know how that works. Microsoft reported they say 579 password attacks every second occur, which represents about 18 billion attacks a year. So FIDO, the Fast Identity Online Alliance, works with all the big players, Microsoft and so forth, on open standards for passwordless authorization and recommended that you use the Authenticator app or Windows Hello. Uh, Hello uses fingerprints or a face print if you have an expensive enough camera. None of my cameras would work with Microsoft Hello, but it, it's and none of my laptops work with it either. But it, it's not clear here when this will be required, uh, but there are instructions in the article on how you can actually set the Authenticator app up on all your Microsoft accounts so you don't have to use passwords anymore. A free master decryptor for Revil ransomware has been released, which would allow any victims of the group to recover any encrypted files without having to pay ransom. Uh, Bitdefender created the decryptor in, in some kind of mysterious fashion that they're not disclosing, but they uh, apparently did this in conjunction with law enforcement. The decryptor works for anything encrypted before the 13th of July 2021 uh, by Revil ransomware. They did not give any other details on how they were able to create the decryptor, but they do provide a link in the article to their site where you can download it for free. So if you have decrypt if you have encrypted files that you'd like to get back from before 13 July, there you go. Some dot mil and dot gov sites have been suddenly displaying ads for porn and Viagra. I mean, you know, it's like porn and Viagra. What a combo. I mean, I mean, what else is new, right? Um, but Zach Edwards investigated this issue and tracked down the vulnerability that was allowing the sites to be compromised. A subcontractor called Laserfish, uh, which is a company that provides services to the FBI, the CIA, the Treasury, the military, and more, uh, was the culprit. The product in particular is called Laserfish Forms. And apparently it contains a file upload field on a public form that, that's obviously set up. You know, you can use this for various things. Uh, so another type of SBOM problem or another supply chain problem, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the field itself can be accessed by unauthenticated users to push files and make that content accessible on the Internet. So it did not compromise the system per se, but it did allow them to push porn content or whatever content they wanted to push up onto these web servers. And then those things got called, I guess, called out in the Laserfish Fish forms. I, I, I'm not sure, but it did. It did not appear that any like data was lost or anything like that. Laserfish did release a cleanup tool that apparently can somehow remove these unauthorized uploads. Edwards said that the vulnerability was not fixed in all versions of Laserfish product, uh, and, but there are remediation steps you can see in that article. So if you have that product or you've embedded that product, you may want to take a look at it. Zoho is a single sign-on and password management tool that had warnings issued by the FBI, CISA, and the U.S. Coast Guard Cyber Command today. So you always see these things like conglomerations, and it's like, oh, and the Coast Guard. Um, they indicated that advanced persistent threat actors were actively exploiting a bug in the tool uh, that had started last month. There is a critical authentication bypass vulnerability in the Soho Manage Engine a a a AD self-service uh, I'm sorry, let me say it again. Manage Engine AD Self-Service Plus platform that will allow remote code execution. So, you know, that's pretty bad. Uh, Zoho, it did issue a patch last Tuesday for the 9.8 severity flaw. So, you know the drill. I mean, you know, you, you've got to patch this stuff up. Um, I, uh, that's scary because that's, you know, that's a password management tool. 
All right. So joining us now, uh, Jeremy Miller is the product manager of offensive security content development at Offensive Security. And uh, Jeremy suggested a topic that was that was near and dear to my heart, uh, and and I thought that was great, uh, which was was uh, soft skills and cybersecurity personnel. And I thought, wow, that's something I don't have. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm really well known for being all warm and fuzzy and having great amounts of human empathy. Um, yeah, I remember one of my recommendation letters that I had a long time ago said, it li- I'm not even making this up, it literally said, does not suffer fools gladly. Um, and I think one of my teacher comments said something about, would rather take a class from Voldemort or Darth Vader than Doug White. But, uh, but you know, I mean, so, so soft skills are a real thing, and Jeremy is joining us now to talk about it. Hi, Jeremy. Hey, Doug. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, some of the skills that were listed in this article that I, I posted on the site were uh, technical skills, obviously, curiosity, uh, I was one I hadn't thought about, uh, but it obviously is a great skill to have. Uh, efficiency, uh, that's uh, risk recognition. <laughs> I, I'm a little weak in that category. Uh, and communication skills, which I'm okay with communication skills as long as I'm preaching at you. Um, so, uh, I, yeah, so th- thanks for joining us. Uh, you said you had a couple of key things here. Uh, what, what do you think? Is this important? I mean, obviously it is, but I mean, tell us why it's important. Sure. I think it's very important, especially from the perspective of someone learning security, getting into the field, um, being able to communicate your thoughts to upper management, to people below you, to people, to your client. Uh, This is a really key part of security because if you can't communicate it, nobody can fix it. Um, There's the other soft skills mentioned there as well, uh, but I think communication is perhaps the most important there. I, I would 100% agree. I mean, I mean, sh- sh- short of tech skills, which is, you know, if I'm interviewing people for entry-level jobs or I'm interviewing people with CISOs, which I do for companies sometimes, um, you know, the, the tech skills are right up there to me. I mean, you know, I, I need you to be able to do the job. But behind that, uh, immediately, communication is certainly one of the skills that comes up. And, and we talk to our students about that a lot. How do you, how do you teach that stuff? I mean, how do you, how do you acquire the, that skill? Yeah, I, th- I think it's hard because yeah. because so many we were talking uh, before Doug, like so many of the people who enter security are you know they're into computers, they're into machines, they're deterministic, uh, they're easy to understand. At least they're understandable. Humans though uh, are weird, so it's hard to communicate sometimes, and especially for you know people who do enter this field. Um, for me, one of the one of the things that really helped was to understand uh, what's called the spotlight effect which is that when you're speaking and when you're uh, presenting yourself in public, nobody is paying as much attention to yourself as you are. So if you can understand that and you can sort of uh, wrap your head around that, then you can realize that everybody else who's listening is also uh, wrapped up in their own head about what they look like to everybody. So that can help with some of the nerves um, that people experience when they're trying to, you know, talk in public. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I, I've certainly seen people essentially flame out their careers in, in a few minutes, you know, just literally. And I, I always talk to my forensic students about that, about, you know, when you go to court, you, you've got a very brief window when you sit there on that, on that expert witness chair or whatever to convince that jury that a, you're empathetic. And, you know, I, uh, that was tough for me. And, and that B that you're, you're knowledgeable. And and it's all this this spotlight effect thing. It's all about. It has nothing to do with the truth. (laughs) You know, (laughs) I mean, literally, I have seen. I I did a case once, and I was not the expert. I was back. I was supporting the expert, and I could tell you the second that the jury turned on the other side's expert. I mean, I could literally. I I was watching because that was my job was to watch the jury and and write back to to my expert about what happened, and and he did fine. But I I saw that other side's expert that minute that they got tagged as arrogant and condescending the jury you just saw the jurors just immediately just kind of tune out and they were like it didn't matter that this person was a world-renowned expert in this subject it it was all about that the jury got convinced that the person was arrogant and condescending and that was it it was over and they lost (laughs) and it it was it was literally minutes you know it, it was just like yeah that guy really biffed it and i try to tell my students that i i mean i don't i have you ever taken training in this kind of stuff? Yeah. So uh, we, at Offsec, we give training. Um, I can't say that much of our content really focuses on soft skills. I think it's an area we'd want to explore and are trying to get into. Um, 
part, part of the challenge there, of course, is in a virtual environment, um, it's, it's difficult to communicate about communication, right? Like how do you teach yeah. somebody to uh, write a pen test report? Uh, there's so many different ways to, to go about it. Everybody, if there's 10 different pen testers, you're going to get 11 different answers there. Um, so that, that is challenging. Yeah. I mean, I certainly saw that with programmers long ago when I was when I was working and managing programmers, and you know, I, I knew ones I would never send upstairs. You know, I mean, I don't care what happened. Yep. I'm not letting John. Uh, sorry, John. I'm not letting John go upstairs because I know what John's going to do when he gets in front of the board. He's going to immediately get angry. If any, you know, he was one of those. He was a good programmer, but the minute somebody asked a question about his code. You know, I mean, if somebody just said, well, how does that work? I mean, he's immediately starts bristling and gets all defensive and, and he gets angry and, and, and boy, I mean, you, I, I wish I had a video of John doing this one presentation because I was like, that could be used as a training exercise. <laughs> I'm like, you, you know, why did you get so upset? I mean, you know, because they, the guy just asked a legitimate question and he just, boom, you know, just all over him. And I remember I was in a, in, a, in a sales presentation once by a person who was trying to sell a company I was working with, a fairly expensive product was in a lot of sales. And one of the things you had to do to do a common task was you had all these layers in the menu. And, and, I, and I said, excuse me, you know, is it possible to get this task moved to the top or can I put that on the top of a menu or customize it? And the guy was like, no. And I was like, uh, okay. And he was like, I designed this and that's why it's that way. And I was like, okay, well, thanks a lot for coming by. I guess we'll buy a different product. Have a nice day. And I mean, I mean, this guy shot himself in the foot, you know, for a million dollars worth of uh, product sales in just moments because I was like, okay, I don't want to deal with this idiot. And you know, I mean, and he was a great programmer too, but he just had no personal skills at all. Mm -hmm. And you do see that. So which so you say communication, and I agree with you is probably the most. What's the second most important one on the list? We'll keep tabs. Yeah, so off I, the table. I don't know if we can uh, we can call this one a soft skill. This isn't on the list. This is another one. Okay. Um, uh, this is sort of straddles the line. There's an aspect of uh, I think self reflection to security, particularly I'm thinking about pen testing uh, on the offensive side, but I believe it also applies to the defensive side. Uh, what I mean there is that when you're hacking a machine or a network or a website, whatever it is, um, there's there's really an aspect of uncertainty. Because if you knew everything there was to know about that machine, then it'd be pretty easy. You would know wh exactly what commands to type in um, to type in at the terminal, and then you'd be done. So the very fact that you need to hack it in the first place is because there's something that you don't know about it. Um, so recognizing that and realizing that your task is to learn more about the environment, about the box, so that your model of it matches reality, um, that helps a lot because then you can start introspecting. You start thinking about how you're thinking about the machine. Um, so we try to we try to communicate that a little bit and uh, get students to realize that when they are uh, performing an attack or thinking about security, they're also working on their own minds at the same time. I, I would add to, I mean, I agree with that. I, I would add that uh, just from my own experience and my own inability to understand other people's feelings, um, when you're attacking that box or that network, you're also attacking the people that support it. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, you know, to me, it's like, I, I'm, I'm happy for you to come in and critique what I'm doing and tell me the weak spots, but not everybody takes that well. <laughs> and, yeah. You know, when you go in and you say, well, this network is really bad, you know, it's like it's full of holes and I'm surprised you haven't hacked the pieces. And, oh, wait, you have been hacked the pieces. Like, you know, I'm, they, they don't take that well. And I think you have to, as a pen tester, you have to learn how to try to talk to the people that you're essentially, especially if you're, if you're purple teaming or, or, or you're red teaming for them. You know, I was an auditor for internal. So I was, I was attacking my own people, you know, mm -hmm. so we're, pre we're prepping them for external, uh, you know, when they get external audited and boy, did they not take that stuff well. And I'm like, look, I'm on your side here. You know, I'm trying to make this good. So this is like the coach yelling at you going, try harder, try harder. What are you a wimp? You know, and that, no, they did not like that at all. And, and it's partially me. Um, all right, one of the skills I would mention is, is that you can't acquire. I, I don't think you can acquire the skill as charisma. Mm. You and I were talking about that the other day. I was talking about my brother and how different my brother is from me because my brother is like, you know, people just like him. 
you know, I mean, and I mean, he, you know, he, when he's, he goes in a room, people sort of gravitate to him. And I used to have a college roommate like it was like that. And, and he was really shy actually. And, but people just liked him anyway. I don't know if he smelled good or what. It was just something about him that attracted people to him. And I'm the opposite of that. You know, people, people meet me and they go, Oh, you know, get, get back off. And, and so, but part of that's your personality, I think too. But I mean, I mean, what kind of, uh, so what can people do to like, assess themselves and start trying to see where what their weaknesses are in these areas yeah i think um assessing assessment is really important so if you take a step back and think about hey what makes me uncomfortable right do i do i have trouble going to communicate in public uh do i have trouble writing up a report figure out the thing that you kind of um, cringe away from Mm -hmm. and then try to understand why like what's what are the aspects of that thing that are bothering you uh, what's what's the sort of cognitive algorithm that you have when you think about that thing that's making you feel sort of uh, about it, um, and then you can start trying to address those things. Yeah, I, I used to try to make lists of stuff I knew would make me angry, mm. like in advance. I was like, what is something that in this in this presentation that when somebody jumps on it, it's going to make me upset because I wanted to have those things sort of identified before I went in that room. Because I knew somebody was going to jump on this, you know, I mean, I mean somebody's going to start on this methodology or this, you know, I mean, I, I used to do statistics too. And, you know, like somebody's going to start on this statistical model. And I, I, just so I would know, I was like, what's going to get under my skin so I can kind of, you know, make myself numb to it, maybe if nothing else. <laughs> I, I mean, I. Uh, what what do you do? I mean, I mean, so you, when so obviously you're a presenter, and and so you're obviously very comfortable talking to me and all that. How did you get there? Because I think you know they say it's the number one fear, right? The number like people are more afraid of public speaking than death. I mean, all those studies they do, and you go, what? You know, I mean, some of us always like to be in front of an audience, and but I mean, most people don't apparently. How do you get? How do you get there? How do you get from? Oh my God! I would never. I would never stand up and say anything in front of any other people. To I'm comfortable up here. So uh, apparently, I, I don't remember this. I've been told that when I was four years old, I got in front of a family gathering, uh, and uh, it was a wedding, and I started speaking, and I didn't even know the bride and groom. I was again four. Uh, <laughs> so I've always, <laughs> I've always been very comfortable. Um, in front of an audience, but there are other things that I've been uncomfortable with, you know, um, uh, speaking to, uh, I don't know, speaking to colleagues for the first time or um, uh, teaching for the first time was difficult. Uh, so one of the things that I like to do is something called comfort zone expansion. And so what you do there is you try to figure out what the thing that bothers you is, and then you do very, very small, um, small steps in that direction. So let's say you have a fear of public speaking. Maybe all you do is you go out in public and you ask a stranger for the time, right? So you go there and you say, hey, I don't have my watch or my phone died. Can you let me know what time it is? And if that makes you uncomfortable, great, go ahead and do that. And then you'll realize that it was fine. Right? That person's just going to give you the time. You're going to go off and have a great day. So um, trying to take small steps in the direction that you're trying to get to without trying to like force yourself to suddenly speak to an auditorium of 100 people. Yeah, I used to tell people, take 25% of the size of the room, okay, up to about, say, five, and find that number of people in the room. But before you start, find those people that look friendly like people you'd like to hang out with. <laughs> and, and spend your time looking at those people. You've got to be careful about it or you end up staring at one person. Like just intent. I've seen people do it like, intently staring at that one person in the middle of the room. And the person's like, oh, what's, why is he staring at me? But find those people that make you feel okay. Not the person that's glaring or the person that looks like the scariest guy you've ever seen. Or the person that looks like the Uber hacker that just walked into the back and you're going, oh, no. Here's this person who can just dissect all the assembly code and they're going to just, you know, never let up and try to focus on those people, just shifting your gaze around to those friendly faces and ignore all those other faces out there and just talk to those friendly people. And some people still struggle with that. And then I say, well, then it's just practice. You know, you're going to suck for a while. So just, you know, get, oh, it's like anything else. You want to start downhill skiing. You're going to suck for a while. 
you know, so if you keep at it in a few years, you'll be good at it. But yeah, that's a really, it's, it, it's tough. And, and I think that it, some of it is talent. I mean, I, I could tell the same story about being a little kid and, you know, standing up in front of the room and trying to play a song or something on the guitar, <laughs> you know, and my mother is going, yeah, it was really embarrassing. Cause we didn't really know most of the people there. And it's like, hi, I volunteer, but, <laughs> and not everybody's like that. So there is some in, in, inherent talent there. Uh, are there other tips you would give to people to, to to acquire soft skills? I think it's the hardest thing. It's a lot easier to learn how to, to manage a network. <laughs> uh, well, I think the point that you made about eye contact is really good. Uh, it's one cool thing is that if you're talking to an audience and you look at you look at one person, uh, everybody else is going to sort of feel that you're looking at them too. Um, so that's a that's a very nice technique there. Um, yeah, something else I think is just not to not to get too frustrated with yourself while you're trying and learning. Uh, it's just like just like learning how to hack or how to do defensive security or program. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. Mistakes are inevitable and they're part of the journey. And taking them as learning opportunities uh, instead of as reflections on your character or reflections on yourself, that's going to go a long way towards creating this positive feedback loop for yourself. And my other two tips are check your ego at the door. Um, yep. you know, if you, if you're, if you're blowing it, I mean, I learned that teaching when I first started teaching, you know, and, and it's like, oh my God, I've screwed this completely up. Just admit it. Like, like, don't, don't try to act like you're, you know, everything in the whole world. Just, just say, oh, I, I really screwed this up. Let's just start over on this. Okay. I'm going to erase this and let's just, just do this again. If we don't do it right. Let's just do it right. And the others practice, 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 you know, I, yeah. I mean, I mean the more, and, and I mean, if, even if that's just practicing by yourself, I mean, I mean, do your presentation to your cat or your dog or, or just to the wall and, and criti critique yourself, you know, while you're doing that. And, and, and I learned to do that too, because I, that's how I used to study. So I know it's weird, but it worked for me because I'm terrible at memorizing things. When I was in college and I had to, I had to take a test, I hated trying to memorize some crap. So what I would do is I would make a lecture about it. I would go find an empty classroom somewhere on campus and I would just stand up there and I would give a lecture about that calculus problem until, and because if I could explain it, even if there's nobody there, I understood it and, and it got in my head. I don't know why it works for me, but it worked. And, you know, sometimes people would look in there and go, are you, are you crazy? You know, do you need, need to be you know, like, you know, medicated or something like, no, but I'm just amusing myself. So why don't you go do something worthwhile? <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, thank you, Jeremy, for joining us on security weekly news. That was a great uh, little segment there. I appreciate your time. And that is, oh, the thank you, Doug. yeah. And that is the news wrap up for the week of 12 September, 2021 in the renewed time of plague. Thanks to Jeremy Miller. Get your shots and we'll see you next week.